Okay, so uh, hi everybody. My name is Vince Rue. Uh, I'm one of the owners and lead researchers at Off Planet Research. And today I get to talk with you about one of our favorite uh, research topics and the subject of one of our recent uh, SBIR awards, the ice in the polar regions on the moon. When we talk about ice on the moon, we have to remember that we're talking about a mixture of various types of ices and regoliths that are on the moon. So while we have some terrestrial materials that come to mind, the icy regoliths on the moon will be quite different from what we have experiences uh, with our current home planet. The two upper pictures, for instance, are ices and soils that are familiar with us, and the lower pictures uh, are of some of the simulated lunar icy regoliths that we make in our labs at OPR. These simulants are made using cryogenic vapor deposition, and they're using uh, several different types of gases and vapors to emulate what we may find on the surface of the moon. So until fairly recently, the accepted view of the moon was that there it was entirely dry. All of the theories on the formation of the moon involved a violent process resulting in a primordial world of a magma ocean without enough gravity to hold an atmosphere. Temperatures would have caused all of the volatiles to boil off and then be blown away by solar wind, leaving a very dry moon. The prevailing theory on the origin of the moon today centers around a giant impact that threw off material that eventually formed the moon. These images are taken from some modeling that was uh, done on the theory by Robin uh, Canop at SWERI a couple of years ago. As the new Earth moon system settled down after that impact, both worlds cooled and some of the first materials that solidified out of that cooling molten body and floated up on the surface was a northazite, which is most of the material in the lighter portions of the moon. The material below that in northazite was darker basalt. Later, larger impacts on the surface of the moon blasted off some of the surface and formed depressions which filled with basaltic lava. And that's what forms the majority of the darker regions on the moon. So looking at the moon today, you can see that the polar regions uh, are highland and made primarily of a northazite rich regolith. And this is an important point uh, that will come up a little bit later. And by the way, uh, Melissa Roth, my uh, fellow founder and lead researcher at uh, OPR is gonna be doing a lot more um, stuff with lunar regolith tomorrow during her keynote, if you'd like to see that. Uh, because the moon has no substantial atmosphere, the material on its surface has developed uh, differently than the soils on earth. And because we're talking about icy lunar regolith, we should have a very brief understanding and talk about regolith in general. So just very quickly, on the earth, there's been billions of years of weathering and erosion uh, and geological reprocessing of the rocks and soils that results in particles being mostly benign, they're polished and, and rounded. And because we have a lot of surface water and there is life on earth, the soil has a lot of organic matter and bugs that make up, the, you know, have their contributions to the material as well. So the material on the surface of the moon uh, is mostly in the form of broken rock and mineral fragments from impacts. And these impacts come from objects in all sizes from kilometers wide to very tiny landing on the surface of the moon very violently. And this ongoing process results in a mineral called, or a material called regolith. Uh, the bulk of the regolith is very tiny particles about the size of cake flour or smaller. And one example of an impact crater here on Earth is Meteor Crater in Arizona, which is shown on the top screen. This, the lower version is uh, an explanation of how micrometeorites continue to uh, evolve the surface of the moon. And because there's no polishing of the rocks and particles on the moon, the regolith is mostly made up of broken surfaces with sharp edges, uh, like what you would see in a rock quarry after they do some blasting. Comparing earth sand and lunar regolith under a microscope, you can see the basic differences between the two types of particles. So the particles on the left is lunar regolith and the particle on the right is some beach sand here on earth. Uh, let's see. So on the earth we have dirt uh, or soil, while on the moon we have something called regolith and lunar regolith has its own unique properties. And there are differences between the dark mare regolith uh, and the lighter colored uh, highland regolith. Uh, physical and mechanical differences. The vapor deposited ices that we use for making uh, our icy regolith add their own unique qualities to the highland regolith, which creates an entirely different kind of material. The ice on the moon uh, comes from gases and vapor being frozen into an extremely cold uh, areas in the polar regions of the moon, <clears throat> similar to why ice forms on Earth in the polar region because it's cold up there. Uh, 
only that on the moon, of course, these, uh, these polar regions are much more extreme. So we'll talk about those conditions. Uh, the conditions on the moon are more extreme for several reasons. The moon has almost no tilt. Uh, so there are no reasons, uh, there are no seasons like there are on Earth. So when the sun shines on the poles obliquely, shadowed areas stay shadowed all year long. The permanently shadowed regions are depressions or craters at the poles, so the warming sunlight never gets directly into them. And because the moon does not have an atmosphere that can help move heat around, the hot places on the moon tend to stay hot, at least during the daytime, and the cold places stay cold. Since the background temperature of space is only about three degrees above absolute zero, it'd be about three degrees Kelvin, space is always absorbing heat from anything that it can. This is why it's colder at night here on Earth, because without the sunlight replacing that warmth, you get cold because space is sucking the heat out. This process goes on constantly. So there are areas that are extremely cold. They can be as cold as seven degrees above absolute zero. At these temperatures, even a gas will freeze into ice and stay solid in space. A more balmy example of how this works on Earth can be seen in the same picture that we saw of Meteor Crater we looked at earlier. This southern wall of the crater that you can see on the right still has ice from it from a previous snowfall, but the rest of the crater is warm and dry. The temperatures are not nearly as extreme in this case, but the effect is basically what we're talking about. So when we look at the moon, uh, this is an image of the south pole of the moon with the permanently shadowed areas marked in blue. Because they are permanently shadowed, if we looked at them without the blue enhancement, uh, they would naturally just appear as pitch black. Based on the expected concentration of ices in those areas and the large number of area, the estimated amount of ice on the moon is in the, the billions of tons. Some of the important questions we need to answer are where did the ice come from? What is it physically like? And what is it actually, what's actually in the ice? All of these questions have implications for how the ice can be mined and processed into things like rocket fuel and drinking water. And what does it tell us about the history of our solar system? So the question of where did the moon ice come from is really part of a larger question about where did water on the moon in general come from? Because it turns out there is water all over the moon. So uh, Dr. Benna, a planetary scientist at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center, recently measured the contents of random impacts of uh, meteors on the moon and found a surprising amount of water in the ejecta from those impacts. Uh, he told CNN in 2019 uh, that, a that the water is widely dispersed over the lunar soil, but it is very thin. One metric ton of regolith uh, in the uh, equatorial and mid-latitudes on the moon yields just about 16 ounces of water. This is just below the surface, which is the amount of about an average water bottle, which you can see for comparison on the left. Uh, contrary to previously held beliefs, uh, the moon has a lot more water than we thought only a few years ago. Each of the large sacks in this image holds about a ton of crushed rock. Even though the surface of most of the moon can get as hot as about 127 degrees Celsius, or hotter than a well-done roast, a few meters down the temperature moderates to just above the freezing point of water. So we still do not know if the water that is spread out over much of the moon is locked inside regolith grains, or if it's frozen between grains of regolith, or if it's both. What makes the ice in the permanently shadowed regions attractive is that it has been uh, indirectly observed on the surface. So it's not, you know, underneath and it, uh, not all of it anyway, some of it is on the surface. Um, and it's also, uh, because it is on the surface, it can also be that, it can be intergranular. And there's also a lot more of it. Uh, the lacrosse experiment observed the, an indication of about 5%, a little bit above that, of the material in the permanently shadowed regions is water ice. And there are estimates that go higher than that. Uh, and there's other things, of course, mixed in with that water, but it's about 15 gallons of water per ton at that rate, uh, which is the image on the right. And this is what makes mining polar moon ice so attractive because there's a lot more of it per ton and it's easier to get at, at least that we know of. So the question becomes, how did we that water get to the moon in general? And why is there so much of the ice <clears throat> in the PSRs? So the most popular theory is what uh, I call ice from above, which includes several possible sources. Uh, there's a tenuous amount of gas, including water vapor, uh, in the space that is in, in orbit around the sun, in the same orbit as the Earth-Moon system. 
Uh, the moon could slowly be picking up ice from this thin cloud over the eons as we travel around like a little vacuum cleaner. Uh, but the more favorite source is uh, when the moon would pass through the tail of a passing comet. This would be quite rare, but over billions of years, the amount of ice that the moon would pick up uh, would be substantial. Also, we have the possibility of the occasional impact uh, of a comet or a cometary fragment into the moon that would deliver a considerable amount of water and gas that would form a temporary atmosphere on the moon, and that would allow ice to be trapped in the PSRs. The constant bombardment of meteors is another possibility, the meteors having trace amounts of water in the same result where it would build up over time uh, and it would be transported into the, uh, the PSRs and held there. One source uh, that has been proved by ex experimentation, which is really interesting, uh, is that solar wind particles can implant themselves into regolith grains. And because solar wind particles, some of them are um, hydrogen atoms, they could combine with OH atoms that are uh, part of molecules within the regolith, knock them loose and form water within the grains. And then that could be a source of lunar water as well. That's actually been proven in the lab. Um, and it's something that is an ongoing process. And of course, solar radiation on the moon is fairly intense. So that's another possibility. Water vapor and gas from volcanic eruptions on the moon are also possible. Uh, a volcanic eruption would create a temporary atmosphere on the moon as well and allow gases to freeze into the PSRs. In a surprising discovery, scientists at NASA and Arizona State University have recently found evidence for dozens of volcanic events on the moon within the past 100 million years, which is a blink of the eye in geologic time, so fairly recently. The components of lunar icy regoliths observed in the LCROSS mission can give some indications of the origins of lunar ice. Uh, when Dr. Colapreet and his team analyzed the contents of the plume after their observations, well, their observations indicated, uh, can be seen in the components on this table to the right. When these components are compared to common components of comets and volcanoes, we can see that both are possible sources. There are some differences, however, but it's important to remember a couple of things about lunar polar ice. Uh, and of course, that LCROSS is one very important data point, but it's still only a single data point, and that more data will hopefully come as soon as the Viper mission to the uh, South Pole gets underway. We also need to keep in mind that remote sensing missions have indicated that lunar ice is not homogeneous, and that there will be variations in ice composition between PSRs and within the same PSR, there'll be variations depending on the local conditions. This indication is made even stronger by the research uh, of Dr. Deutsch at Brown University, and he shows that there seems to be a wide range of ages for the various icy areas based on the apparent age of craters in those icy areas. And the range for those uh, PSRs for their existence ranges from several billion years to several thousand years. If the source of water varies over time uh, from volcanic to cometary, uh, cometary to uh, solar implantation, and uh, the spaces between where solar implanted ice has been accumulated, the ice observed in one location could not only be different physically and chemically, but it could have come from different sources as well. So it's likely that the accumulation of ices in the PSRs uh, in an ongoing, is an ongoing process. The question is, what's the rate of accumulation and are there any current sources of ice uh, that are feeding the accumulation of ice? Is it an ongoing process? Laboratory research uh, with realistic icy regolith simulants can begin to answer some of our questions about lunar icy regolith. Making this material is quite challenging because it must be created with similar conditions and materials and processes as the ones that form the real thing. The formation process also needs to be able to vary the chemical composition, the physical structure, and the concentrations, you know, uh, percent concentrations so that we can study the many possible types and forms of ices that we may find on the moon. The image on the left is simulated lunar icy regolith, where the ice was formed as intergranular uh, with a frost on the surface. And this was done to help test the engineering version of the uh, near-infrared volatile spectrometer system, or the NERVIS. Uh, that's one of the instruments that's gonna be on the Viper rover that's scheduled to land at the South Pole of the Moon in the next couple of years. For these tests, we made two different mixtures of icy regolith. Uh, and they were made so that they could test the nervous model to see if it could tell the difference in the concentrations of the various materials, the various chemicals within the ice. 
this is one example of uh, how valuable laboratory testing of these kind of materials can be. So the ice formed uh, for the nervous test was intergranular, uh, and that was a form that was indicated by the L cross mission. However, it's likely that icy regolith on the moon exists in other forms as well. Transient events on the moon, like nearby impacts, could briefly warm patches of ice, which would then refreeze into globules. Uh, under the right conditions, larger concentrations of icy regolith could form, and some researchers have suggested a subsurface solid ice structure that could have been modified by impact gardening over long periods of time to create the mixture that we observed in Elcross. The images here are globules of icy regolith formed by uh, changing the formation conditions in the lab. And again, these ices are made by cryogenic vapor deposition of the nine L-cross components, the primary uh, components that were uh, viewed. This specific experiment demonstrated the difference in how ice forms within Mari simulant, uh, which is shown on the left, and the Highland simulant, which is shown on the right. Most of the PSRs uh, have highland regolith. Differences in the regolith chemical composition of, or sorry, differences in the regolith and chemical composition of the ices and the formation methods will produce notable differences in the physical structure of the uh, resulting icy regolith. Studying and testing using a variety of possible forms would be advisable before we start going and sending a whole bunch of missions to the moon because you have to test in all the various possibilities to make sure that your mission is going to work like you want it. The current favored uh, first generation of extracting water and other volatiles from icy regolith uh, is to use a chamber that's either filled with icy regolith or placed over the icy regolith and heated using reflected sunlight. The plans use cooling, or sorry, cooled portable tanks to condense the gases back into ice and transport it uh, to a central processing plant. This would be the first stage in separating the ice from the regolith and concentrating it. The central processing plant would further refine the volatiles for use as a propellant for life supporting water and breathable oxygen and other uses. But no matter what the eventual process is for mining and processing lunar icy regolith, there are, some, there are several challenges uh, that the industry is currently working on and all of them can be overcome with persistence and motivation. So I don't want this to seem like we can't do it because we can, we just gotta solve these issues. Regolith itself is notorious for destroying hardware, uh, including seals. All extraction and refinement will require seals that can work in the presence of regolith uh, or there'll be an unacceptable fraction of the volatiles that'll get lost into space during the extraction process. Industrial processes uh, will need larger sealing surfaces uh, to process the quantities of ice that we're talking about uh, to make the, the current uh, estimates for the, the volumes that we're gonna need to produce of these various uh, materials. The mining equipment, material handling machinery, uh, such as rovers, they'll all need to be able to work for long periods of time in regolith, and this will require uh, a very large increase in our mechanical capabilities. Uh, over what we have right now. Another challenge is the basic nature of icy regolith. It's actually reactive. It, it's not a passive material. The volatiles within it are quite volatile. Um, they can interact with each other chemically above certain minimum temperatures and they can have some surprising results. The physical effects uh, of sublimation can cause problems for the equipment if the designs are not appropriate. The image on the left shows how a sample of icy regolith uh, simulant with the concentrations of volatiles similar to what were observed in lacrosse data, uh, reacted as the constituents volatized during an extraction test. The experiment was to measure the loss of uh, sample mass as the extraction was conducted. And the graph shows the indication of the forces of the volatization on the scale in the crucible. And larger amounts of icy regolith could produce proportionally larger forces uh, inside an extraction plant. So as these volatiles are bubbling off, um, they're getting trapped under the regolith, which then will release them in a burst uh, and causes some uh, very interesting physical reactions, but it also scatters regolith all over the place. So it's, this is a very reactive material. Anorthosite also loves volatiles, and the primary component of polar regolith is anorthosite. Uh, highland can absorb, the, the grains in the highland regolith can absorb uh, these volatiles like billions of tiny sponges, this changes the cohesion and the density of the regolith in the process of extraction. So if this material is traveling through an extraction plant, it's gonna change. 
the anorthosite can expand in place, which could jam the equipment, and uh, the pressure of expansion, if the material or if the equipment isn't designed properly, could cause some unexpected internal pressure uh, in certain structures and cause some failures. The regolith will basically be a new material after going through any extraction process because it is changed by both the deposition of the ice and the extraction. This will have certain benefits and challenges that differ from other lunar regoliths. So it's an entirely different kind of regolith now. Because this regolith will already be in a system, and because regolith is very difficult to collect up and transport and handle, it's important to understand these physical characteristics because it's very likely going to be the feed material for another ISRU step. So we need to know what this material is and how it's going to be handled in the equipment. So what is the end goal and the benefit for the average human? And as I mentioned in a previous discussion, uh, that the uh, once the infrastructure is in place, we can save hundreds of millions of dollars uh, per satellite uh, in maintaining and servicing those satellites in place and reducing the costs of launches. And that will reduce the cost to the end user here on Earth. So there's an everyday average person benefit to this whole big picture that we're talking about, about space economy. And of course, we all talk about it. And I, I personally believe it's very true that space generated power could provide enough low cost clean electricity to replace gas and diesel engines and uh, other climate impacting industrial processes and improve the quality of life for the average human here on Earth, as well as the benefit for everybody on Earth having uh, access to this power. So there are very real benefits for the average person uh, in a, uh, a space-based economy. And we need to keep a, an eye on that so that we can maintain the momentum and we can return those benefits that we're capable of returning. I think it's our, our duty to do that. And ultimately, the reason for becoming a multi-planet species is to better understand, uh, to better the lives of everyone and ensure the survival of humanity. And as our next stage of development begins, we need to ensure that we work to make sure this vision becomes a reality while not repeating errors that humanity has made in the past and being better than our former selves. And of course, learning to survive and thrive on the moon is our first step toward what I hope and I think a lot of people believe is a better and larger existence for humanity. So that is my presentation. Okay, awesome, Vince. Thank you so much. We have a couple questions in the chat. Um, Owen asks, how much harder would extraction of water ice be in the highlands? Would it be a limiting factor for colonization outside of the South Pole? Okay, is it harder to extract volatiles from highland regolith uh, than Mare regolith? Was that the question? Yes. Okay, in a non-polar setting, uh, the general answer is no, because once you have the equipment in place, the processes are very similar. The peculiarities of the process can be a little bit different because the chemistry is in fact different of the raw material. Um, so from that standpoint, no. However, what you're going to be extracting, uh, extracting oxygen is easier from the Mari, from everything that we've seen, because the Mari contains a higher content of metal oxides. And those are the easiest to separate out through an electrolysis process after you heat it up and, and get the right conditions. Also, the nice thing about that is when you're done extracting those um, gases, uh, what you're left with uh, is very easy to then perform a secondary extraction on and get metals such as titanium and iron and nickel and all kinds of cool stuff that you can use to make structures, spacecraft tools, sell to people. Um, so it's a question more of economics than whether or not it's harder or not and what you're going to get out of it from the first, first cycle in the process and the ultimate cycle in the process. I hope I answered the question. Um, next question is from Marlene. What are some uses of the components of the ice? I uh, love that question. Okay, so the components of the ice, there are all kinds of them. Some are really nice and some of them are not so nice. Um, the primary component that everybody's interested in is water and of course deriving hydrogen and oxygen from the water because that's got an immediate use as a, a, a rocket propellant and also you can breathe it and you can drink it. Um, however, the other components in it, the uh, hydrogen sulfide and sulfur dioxide, that sort of thing, can be used to make binders, as people have discussed in the past. So you can use that in secondary ISRU to make things. Um, uh, please uh, mute if you're not speaking. Let me see that. Uh, other aspects of it, there's uh, methane, ethylene, uh, all kinds of other stuff, ammonia, which has very specific uses. Um, as a cooling system or a heating system, 
uh, component. You can also combine these chemically to make plastics, uh, which is really interesting because that way you can make everyday household stuff. So once you're inside the habitat, you're gonna need cups, plates, you're gonna need clothes, you're gonna need all kinds of things, space components. So basically you can use every single thing. If you point to anything in lunar polar ice and I can tell you an ISRU purpose that it will make things better and cheaper and uh, that sort of thing. So it's all usable. There isn't any throwaway. Okay. Does anyone else have a question? Feel free to unmute and ask. <laughs> A question that a lot of people uh, ask us is, how are you going to get at that ice, and are we going to have astronauts going into PSRs? Uh, and uh, the answer to that is, I wouldn't want to be the astronaut that's asked to go into a PSR, because uh, seven degrees above absolute zero, we don't have a suit that can handle that. Uh, so we're probably looking at some sort of process that is not uh, human-centered, uh, and it's going to be automated and mechanical. And there's a lot of really interesting ideas on how to do that. Um, and a lot of design challenges as well, because now you not only have to design systems that can stand up to regolith, but can hold pressure and operate in really cold temperatures. And, um, there's a lot of really interesting work being done in that. And a lot of the, the applications for our icy regolith uh, simulants that we make um, have to do with developing those processes. Uh, and there's going to be a lot of intensive activity around these areas uh, of research um, in the near future. Question from Christine. How, tell us a bit about off-planet research. She might have missed that at the beginning. Okay. Uh, actually, no, I didn't go too much into it because, uh, you know, the, the topic was icy regolith, not off-planet. But uh, off-planet research, uh, Melissa and I formed that company a couple of years ago, well, what, six, seven years ago. Uh, the purpose. Five. Thank you. Five. <laughs> Hello, Melissa. Uh, the purpose is to uh, reproduce environments that we find in space, particularly on the surface of other planets, and it's for doing the, this kind of work. It's for developing technology, uh, and we uh, reproduce aspects of those environments. One of the big ones right now is um, a lunar regular simulant because it's the foundation for a huge amount of research. It is the foundation for ISRU. It's the foundation for um, remote sensing. Uh, it's the foundation for uh, locomotion on the moon. You name it, if you're doing it on the moon, you've got to have really good lunar regular simulants in order to prove your technology and to do the basic research. Um, we do also uh, act as an advisory role for organizations that are conducting design work. Uh, and research. Uh, we not only provide the simulants, but we also do our own uh, design and testing of components. Um, one of our more recent grants uh, was from NASA to produce uh, a type of self-cleaning connector that will work in a regolith environment to transfer uh, gas and fluids between ISRU processes and rovers or hook up so that you can have reliable connections to spacesuits and that sort of thing. Um, so there's an awful lot of work to do, and we're involved in a lot of the aspects of that. Um, we're, we're very interested in helping to lay the foundation for those um, technologies and those industries. Okay, folks. Well, it's 1.30, so there are other sessions starting. I can keep going a little bit with Vince and Melissa and ask a couple more questions, but just bear in mind everyone's going to start uh, leaving. So uh, let's see. Sejal asks, do we have sufficient ice to support long-term habitation on the moon? Oh, yes, we do. Uh, there are various numbers of estimates for how much ice is on the moon, but all of them are more than sufficient to support, uh, at a bare minimum, decades of intense use. Um, the more acceptable estimates are more like hundreds of years, but of course there's a lot of uh, variability in that, but there's a lot of it there. Ultimately, though, what you have to realize is that uh, ice is the low-hanging fruit. It'll give us a foothold. It'll get us what we need to do. But there's a lot more resources, and space is huge. So it's not just ice. It's everything. And that is cool because it allows us to reserve some areas of these regions for scientific study and not to mess with them industrially, which I think is very important. But there's a lot of ice. Mm -hmm. Also, you know, you can email us if you have any questions as well. David, uh, you have your hand raised. Would you like to unmute and ask your question? Yeah, real quick. I just wanted to see if you had uh, been able to produce any simulants that have adhesion and uh, 
the uh, wear characteristics of real lunar dust? Oh, that's a good question. That was actually our first priority when we started this. We started as mechanical engineers trying to design equipment ourselves, and that was those were the, the qualities of the simulants that we were most interested in. So we started out designing what they call mechanical simulants, which do exactly what you're talking about. Um, so the answer is yes. Uh, however, you have to put a big asterisk by that. It is a simulant that's not the real thing. So it's, you get as close as you can until you get ridiculous when it comes to how much it costs to produce that. Our simulants, we're on the very high end of that uh, fidelity. So I'm very confident in using it as a test material, but it is of course a simulant and anybody that works on them will say, you can't reproduce the real thing. And they're right, you can't. Um, but you do the absolute best you can to ensure the most likely and, and most, uh, most successful missions. And that's what we did. Yeah, and that's also why we offer a variety of simulants to, to jump in with Vince is we, we understand that there's very different types of testing and research being done. Everything from agricultural re research to testing rover wheels to testing remote sensing equipment, they all require different test materials because they're gonna focus on different properties. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of the holistic approach we want to take. Yeah, so we can vary the contents and the qualities of the simulant uh, to produce pretty good, very, very, high fidelity simulants, depending on what you're doing. So mechanical, chemical, uh, biological, all kinds of things. We get asked to do a lot of that across the board. Okay, thank you. Words. Questions from uh, Rodrigo Romo from the Pisces team. Has there been average energy requirement for extraction of water from regolith, kilowatts per hour slash M3, for example? Oh, that's gonna depend on your system. Uh, I would say you'd have to refer to the actual papers because there's a couple of things. There's the type of simulant that was used, uh, IC regular simulant. People have used all kinds of simulant. Uh, so um, I don't have a direct answer for that right now. Uh, I think uh, that answer is gonna come very quickly because that's where a lot of research is being focused. Uh, if you want to send me an email saying, hey, let's take a look at this, I'd be happy to, to help you look at some data, but I don't have a number off the top of my head. It doesn't take much though, because you're in a vacuum and uh, all you gotta do is get this stuff up to the point where it starts to volatize off. And you want to do that gradually because you don't want to have some of these ice components mixing at a higher temperature because they will chemically react with each other and then things get really interesting. So you want to control that process. Okay, next question. Could you tell the role of moon gravity in the extraction process? Wow, uh, that's an interesting question as well. I don't think it's very gravity dependent. It is a uh, energy and chemically dependent. Um, it does make it easier because you don't have to have such a robust vehicle to transport it because of the reduced effects of gravity. Um, but I don't think that in the basic process, I don't think gravity has a, a significant effect on the extraction processes, uh, at least as we have them now. And I think that person's also asking, what does the machine consist of mainly? Which machine? <laughs> I'm not sure what they're asking. Uh, uh, Joshua, if you want to unmute and clarify your question. Hey, Joswee Kamaretti, if you want to clarify your question. Hmm. Okay, we can move on, I guess. Um, Andrew Lindberg would like to know how much carbon for producing methane for rocket fuel is present in the regolith? Ooh, the moon is not really rich in carbon. Um, there's carbon from carbonaceous uh, impactors that come in. Uh, there's carbon in like the methane and that sort of stuff. Uh, but carbon is not what you would call a plentiful component on the moon. And it's really interesting because when you start talking about how are you going to grow plants on the moon, you've got to bring in carbon. Uh, there is carbon dioxide in the ice that you can extract out as well. But um, that, that is a challenge. Carbon dependent processes having them on the moon uh, is something you've got to really think about and plan for. But it is possible. Okay, great. Any other questions? Oh, well, there's one more. Uh, Bill C. asks, when you talk about gradually bringing up the temperature to volatize gases, do you try to bring up the temperature in steps 
so as to free up one volatile gas at a time? That's a really good question. Um, regolith loves to hang on to whatever temperature it's at. It is so resistant to changing temperature, it's ridiculous. Uh, so when you are raising the temperature to extract these volatiles, you've got to be very patient because it takes a while. It would be best to do it slowly. Um, however, it doesn't, it isn't like you got a bunch of regolith and you raise it by three degrees and you lose all of the methane, which is going to be the first thing to come off because it's got the lowest uh, freezing point. Um, it's more dependent on the size of the sample and what, as the temperature, the increase in temperature creeps into the mass, uh, stuff is released off. So after your initial release starts, it is more of a mixture because as the temperature goes in, you have volatiles releasing at different points at different time within the mass. Uh, so you can't necessarily control it just that way. However, you could take a sample, you could thin it out and spread it through a process and incrementally raise it as it goes through the process, that might work. Um, but you can't just take a handful of it slowly and increase it and just get methane and then just get carbon dioxide. It, it doesn't behave that way, at least not naturally. Okay, any other questions? Last chance. Vince, uh, Melissa, would you like to preview your talk tomorrow a little bit? How does this one tie into that one? I'm gonna leave I'll, that to Vince. Uh, I was gonna say, Vince stole a little bit of my thunder. So you'll, you'll hear a little bit about regolith in the beginning. I'll expand on it though. I also um, promoed you, I promoed you. Thank you, thank you. Um, <laughs> And so I'll talk about regolith and how it's formed and kind of a lot of the characteristics of it in a little bit more detail than Vince. But then the bulk of my presentation is really focusing on the challenge of the dust. Why is dust a challenge, um, both physically and how abrasive it is and um, to human health? Um, but then how can we really utilize the dust and the regolith to the most potential and get um, resources out of it. So again, Vince talked um, a little bit about uh, the, the, the resources and the extraction and, and being able to utilize them. And I'll go a little bit more into that as well. So uh, our presentations tie well with one another. Let's put it that way. Very good. Um, one last question just came in from Charles. What is the easiest method to identify water? Oh. Okay, so that's a really good question because the water, water signatures using you know, from remote sensing, it reacts to several different frequencies in both light and radar. So you get spikes uh, in various places for water uh, and that's for various reasons, but it, it's surprisingly difficult to say that's definitely water uh, when you're looking at remote sensing data. Um, you know, some, are, some ways are better than others. Uh, the easiest way, I would say you want to have multiple remote sensing, and this is the way it's been done, big surprise, multiple methods of remote sensing, both radar return data, uh, there has been some ability to do monitor like infrared or uh, other types of, of light-based uh, refraction, um, that sort of thing. There's neutron absorption, but what you want to do is you want to take those indications and overlay them with each other and look for commonality of positive or potentially positive results. And then you want to match that with what your knowledge is of the physical area and whether or not it makes sense. And where all of those overlap and line up, you can put a big red circle around and say, let's go look there, that makes sense. Um, and that, that's what's been done in, in my presentation, those blue areas, that, that's what's been done to identify those. And then, uh, based on some of that, when L cross, uh, when the L cross mission happened, they, they picked one of those likely areas, and of course that's where they impacted. And hey, we got water, so it's it's a pretty good, uh, pretty good validation of that method. But there, I don't know of any one outside of physically holding it up and extracting it off and going that's water. Remote sensing wise, I don't think there's one. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks a lot, everybody. I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thanks a lot for this talk, Vince and Melissa. Appreciate it. Thank you, James. Take care, guys.